Alright, we are going to start talking about the peripheral nervous system. Um, this chapter will not be on the second exam. It will be on the last exam, which will be given on your last lab weekend. So um, even though we're going over this um, before the second exam, you won't have to worry about this information um, until the last exam. So hopefully um, we'll make this short and sweet. The peripheral nerve system is um, not as complex as some of the other systems we've talked about. Um, so hopefully you'll be, it'll be a relief reading through this chapter. Okay, so the peripheral nerve system, um, it includes all of the neural structures distal to the spinal nerves. So it includes axons of sensory motor and autonomic neurons um, along with all the sensory endings and everything that we've talked about and the entire postganglionic um, autonomic neurons. The, the, all of that forms the peripheral nervous system. So um, all the different nerves that we talked about in kinesiology innervating the individual muscles, the median nerve and the ulnar nerve and um, the obturator nerve and uh, sciatic nerve, all those are part of the um, peripheral nerves. Um, the autonomic nervous system axons are also included in the peripheral nervous system. So there's a nice picture in the book where it shows the division between the peripheral and the central nervous systems. Um, so basically the central nervous system, we've talked about this before, it's anything that's encased in bone. So um, this picture shows the spinal column um, the nerves going in and out of the dorsal and um, uh, dorsal horn and uh, the ventral horn and um, everything to the left of the dotted line in this picture is peripheral. Everything to the right of the dotted line is central. Um, so that's just to clarify that. So. Um, this is another nifty little picture from the book um, that shows the all the things we've talked about, the dorsal root ganglion, the, um, the dorsal root, the ventral root. Um, so when after it goes outside of the vertebrae, um, it's the nerve root splits off into a dorsal ramus and a ventral ramus. Um, also known as posterior for the dorsal and anterior for the ventral. Um, so the um, axons in the posterior rami innervate the paravertebral muscles, posterior parts of the vertebrae, and the overlying cutaneous areas. Axons in the anterior or um, ventral rami innervate the skeletal, muscular, and cutaneous areas of the limbs and the anterior and lateral trunk. So um, when we start talking about peripheral nerve lesions, they produce signs and symptoms in a peripheral nerve distribution. Um, spinal lesions produce signs and symptoms in a myotomal or dermatomal distribution. So the chart, the dermatome chart that we've looked at over and over again, one half of the body is represented in dermatome distributions the other half is represented in peripheral nerve distributions. So part of the way that um, neurologists and physical therapists distinguish between a central um, a, or a spinal region lesion versus a peripheral nerve lesion is the, the distribution of symptoms. So is it in a peripheral nerve distribution or is it a myotomal or dermatomal distribution? So um, there's this really, really, really long 49 minute uh, lecture on the peripheral nervous system. You really don't have to watch it unless you're just dying for more auditory input. You don't have anything else to do. You're bored out of your mind and you got to listen to this lecture or you just want more detail. So maybe um, you listen to it at the end of the quarter after you've done everything and you just want more detail, but that's not required, but it's there for you if you want it. So um, we're going to just start to talk about the anatomy of the peripheral nerves. So 
Peripheral nerves themselves, they consist of parallel bundles of axons that are surrounded by three connective tissue sheaths. And I would like you to know the definition of these sheaths and um, what they surround. So the endoneurium separates individual axons. So each individual axon has an endoneurium around it, also known as the nerve sheath. And the perineurium surrounds bundles of axons, which are also known as fascicles, and the epineurium encloses the entire nerve trunk. So um, if you're looking, if you go to a cadaver lab and you're looking at the sciatic nerve, which is huge, um, the sheath around that whole big nerve is the epineurium, okay? And then you'd have to further dissect it to get to the perineurium and the endoneurium. So um, there's this lovely um, picture in the book, cross-section of um, peripheral nerves. It shows three fascicles. So the perineurium is around each of those three fascicles. Um, the little small, tiny little black circles, those are the endoneurium. And then the epineurium is around the whole thing, all three of those guys, okay? So, the peripheral nerves, they supply either the viscera or somatic structures. So, um, somatic peripheral nerves, like when we talk about the um, musculocutaneous nerve and the median nerve and everything, they're usually mixed, including sensory, autonomic, and motor axons. That's why when you get a nerve injury, you get sensory, motor, and autonomic symptoms, okay? So, the cutaneous branches supply the skin and the subcutaneous tissues, muscular branches supply the muscles, tendons, and joints, and um, peripheral axons are classified according to speed of conduction and diameter. Just like we were talking about in the somatosensory chapter, the same thing applies to peripheral nerves which have some of those sensory nerves in them. So um, there's this little chart which I by no means want you to memorize, but it's nice to just be familiar with these nerves. So um, basically they're the ones we've talked about before, the old 1A and uh, 1B and 2 and A delta and C and A beta, all those different ones. And this just shows a comparison of conduction speed versus axon diameter and whether they're myelin myelinated or not. So um, the nerve axons are electrically insulated from each other by the endoneurium and by a myelin sheath. So um, the myelin sheath is, of course, uh, made by the Schwann cells, which we talked about way back in Chapter 2. Um, so a Schwann cell might partially surround a group of small axons, or it might completely envelop a section of a single large axon. So the small diameter axons that share swan cells, those are the ones we call unmyelinated. So they're really partially myelinated. There's actually no um, axon in our body that's completely unmyelinated, but um, they call it unmyelinated because it's relatively unmyelinated compared to those large ones. So the large diameter axons um, that are fully wrapped by individual swan cells, those are the ones we call myelinated. Those are the fast ones. Um, so the, you know, it's, it's a minor distinction, but there you go. And of course, we know that large myelinated axons conduct impulses faster than small, relatively unmyelinated or partially myelinated axons. It all makes sense with what we've learned before, hopefully. So, um, the anterior rami, they, um, they break off into what we call these nerve plexes. So uh, an individual one is a plexus, the plural of it is plexes. Um, and so there are four main nerve plexes. And um, I would like you to know what is innervated by each of these nerve plexes. And this is information that um, when you have lower extremity orthopedics in the summer and upper extremity orthopedics next fall. Um, Heather will expect you to know this information coming into those classes about the nerve plexes. Um, so 
the the first one is the cervical plexus and it arises from the anterior rami of nerve roots C1 through C4. Um, it lies deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It arises from or it emerges from between the anterior and the medial scalenes. So it provides cutaneous sensory information from the posterior scalp to the clavicle and it innervates the anterior neck muscles and the diaphragm. So functionally the phrenic nerve which um, comes from uh, nerve root C3 through C5 is the most important single branch of the cervical plexus because the phrenic nerve is the only motor supply and main sensory nerve for the diaphragm. So if there's something wrong with that one we can't breathe and that's a big deal. So um, that is functionally the most important single branch from the cervical plexus. Okay. Um, so this is a nice little diagram of the cervical plexus. You don't really have to worry about the the legend that talks about the shading in there, but and nor do you have to memorize the arrangement of the cervical plexus. This is just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Okay, the brachial plexus is formed by the anterior rami of C5 through T1, and the brachial plexus innervates your entire upper limb. Um, so the um, it emerges between the anterior and middle scalene muscles, passes deep to the clavicle, enters the axilla. In the distal axilla, the axons from the plexus become the radial, axillary, ulnar, median, and musculocutaneous nerves, which we know innervate all of the muscles and provide all the sensory and autonomic information for the upper extremities. Okay, so there's the little diagram of the um, nerve root C5 through T1 and how they break off into the brachial plexus. And we, I know that you've been had a, some exposure to this in kinesiology. We will talk about it again, and Heather will talk about it again in upper extremity orthopedics. So this is information that keeps coming up again and again throughout the program. And when that happens, you figure it's pretty important knowing these things, these um, brachial plexus things. So there's some videos about the um, different plexes, which just describe the nerves that come off them. Um, they're really just kind of interesting. There's some good animations in there. Um, it's nice to be able to be, you know, because neuro is so conceptual, it's nice to be able to visualize some of these things. So really that's what I put the videos in there for to kind of help you visualize these things. Um, they're short, which is nice for the videos. And, um, there's one that sh uh, shows you how to draw the lumbar plexus. So the lumbar plexus is formed by the anterior rami of L1 through L4 um, and the plexus forms in the psoas major muscle. So um, the branches of the lumbar plexus innervate the skin and muscles of the anterior and medial thigh. And um, the uh, cutaneous branch from the plexus um, continues into the leg to innervate the medial leg and foot. So um, when you look at that peripheral nerve distribution on that same chart as the dermatome distributions, you'll see these um, different nerves. And you'll see the nerves that we talked about in kinesiology, the obturator, femoral, um, and then, you know, some of the other nerves. And I don't necessarily, I'm not going to ask you specific nerves. Um, on the exam, um, but just just to know that those nerves arrive from the, arise from the lumbar plexus. So um, again, a few more little videos. Um, the sacral plexus innervates the posterior thigh and most of the leg and foot. Um, so unlike the other plexes, which contain sympathetic axons, um, because remember it's the cervical thoracic outflow. Um, the sacral plexus contains parasympathetic axons, which is the cranial sacral outflow. So um, it has the somatic axons and the parasympathetic axons. So um, there's a little figure um, showing the lumbar and the sacral plexes um, and what they are innervating. And so the sciatic nerve goes down the posterior thigh, leg, and foot, and that is um, that arises out of the sacral plexus. So 
Branches of the cervical, brachial, brachial and lumbar plexus provide sympathetic innervation via connections with that sympathetic chain. So as we start to progress through the rest of the systems in the book, it's going to be referring back to things that we've already learned. So it's starting to tie everything together. And I hope that you um, sort of feel that that's helpful in tying those things together. So um, in the PowerPoint, it goes through all the plexes in detail um, and the um, information that I talked to about what individual ones innervate. Um, it's that is nice information to know um, for quizzes and exams. What is innervated by the different plexes? Okay, so um, movement is really important in nerve health because it. Um, promotes blood throw through the nerves and the flow of the axoplasm through the axons um, and it causes it to be thinner and flow more easily. Um, so movement is um, a lot of times if you're immobilized um, it compromises your nerve health and you can have some paresthesias or some other nerve symptoms. So um, movement is you know of course we're all pro movement um, there's a little, um, just talking about the mobility characteristics of nerves, you know, of course we move and our nerves have to be able to move and stretch and the fascicles have to glide within the nerves and the nerves glide relative to other structures. Um, and so the connective tissues around the nerves um, help support the changes in length during the movements. So one of the things that comes up a lot with injuries is nerve tension um, and do you have too much nerve tension and how can you change that. So the, the one assignment this week is talking about nerve tension positions. So all of the videos on this page in the module about mobility characteristics shows nerve glide positions and nerve mobility exercises for all these different nerves. So um, what I ask you to do in the assignment is to take one of these positions and find um, a functional position where you might pu be putting that nerve on stretch. Um, for example, if you lie with your, um, on your back with your hand underneath your head, um, and you might be putting the ulnar nerve on stretch. And so maybe you're, you're lying back on bed reading with your hand behind your head and then you get some ulnar nerve symptoms, some tingling in that ulnar nerve distribution. So um, I just want you to pick one of those um, nerve tension positions and uh, link it to a functional activity. So um, that's kind of interesting. And we do a lot in physical therapy. We do a lot with nerve mobility after an injury. Um, we might teach someone how to do a nerve glide um, and um, there are a lot of different neurodynamic exercises which you will learn in um, lower extremity and upper extremity orthopedics this summer and fall. So um, now that we talked about kind of the structure of nerves, we're going to talk about um, nerve dysfunction. So um, you know that's that's how we usually do things here. Uh, we're going to talk a little more about the um, neuromuscular junction, um, but we'll talk about it a little bit later. And it's nothing new that we haven't talked about before, but we're just going to review it again um, because we're, it's part of the peripheral nerve system. So um, when you have peripheral nerve damage, you get sensory, autonomic, and motor changes because the peripheral nerves carry sensory, autonomic, and motor fibers. So um, all of the signs are in a peripheral nerve distribution, so they're not going to be in a dermatomal distribution. Um, they'll be with like a spinal lesion or a central nervous system lesion might be. They will be in peripheral nerve lesion. That's one of the ways you can distinguish between a central problem and a peripheral problem. So with sensory changes, they can include um, decreased or lost sensation. That makes sense. So, for example, after a surgery where they make the incision, um, you might have some areas that feel numb. So that's the decreased or lost sensation. And remember the abnormal sensations that we talked about in Chapter 7 and 8, the hyperalgesia where it's 
ultra sensitive dysesthesia, which is um, pain, uh, painful abnormal sensation, paresthesia, which is abnormal, and the dysesthesias are like the um, electrical or uh, ting you know tingling or zapping sensations. The paresthesias are the um, non-painful abnormal sensations, and the allodynia is the um, things that are normally not painful then become painful. So those sensory changes can uh, happen with peripheral injuries. So um, autonomic changes can happen, and they depend on whether one or more ner axons are affected. So if it's a single nerve, um, usually you only get autonomic changes if the nerve is completely severed. Um, if it's a lot of different nerves, um, there might be other autonomic uh, problems um, like regulating blood pressure, heart rate, sweating. You might have abnormal um, skin responses. There might be problems with bowel and bladder functions if the, the right or the wrong nerves are affected um, or impotence. So um, with motor changes, um, signs of nerve damage might include paresis or paralysis. So you could have partial or total loss of motor function. Um, if a muscle is absolutely denervated, um, then it'll show up on um, electromyograms uh, uh, with no activity. And once a muscle is completely denervated, you're, it's going to atrophy pretty quickly because it needs that neural input in order to um, keep its strength. And um, when you, with a denervated muscle, the muscle fibers actually um, ha develop a sensitivity to acetylcholine along the muscle membrane. And so any acetylcholine that's in the area, it will cause fibrillations, um, which are the, like muscle twitching. Um, and that doesn't necessarily indicate that it's a specific lesion, um, but it's just something that can happen with uh, denervated muscles. Um, you also get what are called trophic changes, where when the nerve supply is interrupted, um, the, s the muscles atrophy, we talked about that, the skin becomes shiny because of the, the interrupted autonomic function, and your fingernails and toenails can become brittle, or finger or toenails, depending on which nerves are affected, can become brittle, and the subcutaneous tissues thicken. So um, you actually can get ultimately you get ulcerations, um, cutaneous and subcutaneous ulcerations, and poor healing of wounds and infections, um, neurogenic joint damage, and uh, blood supply issues, So um, and loss of sensation and lack of movement. So a lot of times you'll see those type of um, changes with uh, what we call polyneuropathies, where a lot of nerves are affected in things like um, late stages of diabetes. Um, you get the poor wound healing and the ulcerations of the skin. So um, that's, you know, that can be pretty serious. And, and actually, that can be something that can ultimately kill you if you have these poor healing of wounds and infections. Um, you end up in the hospital and you... Um, if you if it's not taken care of, it can get septic and spread throughout your system. So it can be a really serious thing. So you start out with some some minor nerve damage, and you end up with a really really serious situation. So when we're talking about neuropathies, um, we're going to talk about three different types of peripheral neuropathies. So they can involve a single nerve, and that's a mono neuropathy. Um, it's something like carpal tunnel syndrome, that is a mononeuropathy that involves a single nerve. Um, it can involve several nerves, and we call that a multiple mononeuropathy, um, and they say it's a multifocal, um, and it's usually asymmetrical, involving individual nerves. So we'll talk about some different things that cause that. And then polyneuropathy involves many nerves, and it's a generalized disorder that um, typically starts distally and has a symmetrical presentation. So um, like diabetic polyneuropathy is one of the examples of that. Um, so th that's one of the ways they distinguish between a, a multiple mononeuropathy and a polyneuropathy is the asymmetrical versus the symmetrical presentation. 
So um, go going to up to the individual ones and the um, mononeuropathies, there can be various types of trauma that injured perif injures peripheral nerves. So depending on the severity of the damage, um, they talk about traumatic myelinopathy, where the myelin sheath is affected, traumatic axonopathy, where the axon's actually injured, or complete severance. Um, so, for example, the carpal tunnel syndrome, it's it's a loss of myelin limited to the site of injury, and um, it can be caused by nerve compression, um, by an entrapment syndrome like um, ulnar nerve entrapment or carpal tunnel syndrome, or it could be compression from an external force like walking on crutches for a really long time, or um, being in a chair where your uh, the your leg is being compressed and you're actually getting nerve compression from that. So um, repeated mechanical stimuli. That's that's where you're um, you know walking on crutches or your leg is compressed against something um, and if it happens over a long period of time it can cause that compression and actually damage the myelin sheath and with carpal tunnel syndrome the myelin sheath is damaged um, and so it's considered a traumatic myelinopathy so there are some little um, uh, micro electro electron microscope pictures of traumatic myelinopathies um, where you can um, see and if you look at these in the book um, it's figure 12-7 uh, and um, you can see them a little bit better than on here and it just shows um, first the first one is normal myelin and you can see the um, the little nodes of Ranvier there are one node in that picture um, and then you can see some um, myelin damage in the second and third ones um, where there's the interruptions in the myelin so that's just kind of interesting to look at there's a little um, pathology box our favorite little pathology box is about carpal tunnel syndrome and um, what can cause it and um, people you know some some people get treated with surgery some people don't I've had um, good success treating early carpal tunnel um, with Graston technique, the tool assisted uh, soft tissue technique. Um, the traumatic axonopathy, um, it's where axons are actually um, disrupted and Wallerian degeneration where the cell breaks down occurs distal to the lesion. So um, it, it can affect any axon. It can affect somatosensation and motor sensation and um, because the axon is is damaged um, it affects everything distal to the lesion so um, we talked about sprouting and um, regeneration of axons in chapter 4 in the neuroplasticity chapter and so um, because the myelin sheath and the connective tissues remain intact that gives a path for the new axon to form the regenerated axon and so they can re-innervate an appropriate target and you can get um, healing from that which is great on the other hand when the um, nerve is completely severed they're physically divided by excessive stretching or by a laceration um, you get immediate loss of sensation or muscle paralysis in the area um, and the proximal and distal nerve stumps are um, some of them can if it depends on how close they are if they say if they're opposed a p p o s e d um, and there's not too much scarring the sprouts can enter the distal stump and and reattach to the target tissue um, if they're too far away from each other or there's too much scarring then it, it won't happen you won't get regeneration so um, with multiple mononeuropathies it involves two or more nerves in different parts of the body so a lot of times it is a um, vasculitis it's an inflammatory process um, um, so inflammatory processes the uh, vascular systems inflamed uh, for, with vasculitis and um, individual nerves are producing like a random asymmetrical presentation um, with polyneuropathies the 
absolutely symmetrical involvement of sensory motor and autonomic fibers. It often goes from distal to proximal. They'll talk about a um, sock and glove presentation where it, uh, it that's the uh, pattern of the presentation. So the symptoms will typically begin in the feet and then they can go in the hands and then um, the feet and the hands are the areas that are supplied by the longest axons and so those are the ones that are affected first. So usually uh, polyneuropathies are not caused by trauma or ischemia. Um, whereas the multiple mononeuropathy and the mononeuropathy are, are mostly caused by pr trauma or ischemia. So um, with polyneuropathy, it can be a toxic, a metabolic, or an autoimmune cause. So um, most commonly, it's caused by uh, diabetes or nutritional deficiencies secondary to other issues like alcoholism um, or autoimmune diseases um, like Guillain-Barre is a polyneuropathy. So um, there are some uh, therapeutic drugs that can cause polyneuropathies and some toxins and um, nutritional disorders that can also cause polyneuropathies. So um, there are some diagrams from the book showing some, br some changes from polyneuropathies, some actual physical changes. Um, Charcot foot is a is one that results from diabetes. It's very distinctive if you ever see someone with it. Um, I've seen several people with Charcot foot and the structure of your foot actually starts to break down and it can be really debilitating. Um, so there's a um, pathology box for the diabetic polyneuropathy um, and then it, the book talks a little bit about um, Guillain-Barre's polyneuropathy and um, an inherited form that's called Charcot-Marie tooth disease. Um, and usually it causes uh, paresis of the muscles um, from the knee down, basically. It results in foot drop and um, it affects their gait and uh, makes them trip more easily. You get muscle atrophy. And um, typically when you're working with people with um, Charcot-Marie tooth, they're, you're working with them on um, a stretching program, strengthening program, working on gait and balance, and uh, sometimes getting them set up with the appropriate assistive devices if those are necessary. And I've worked with um, two or three people with um, CMT, and it's a pretty interesting disease process. So um, there's a little uh, section in the book with dysfunction of, of the neuromuscular junction. We talked about myasthenia gravis in the um, in chapter two, or in chapter three, um, uh, with the acet it's an autoimmune disease that affects the acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction. So repeated use of the muscle, you get increased weakness. So muscles that you use a lot, like postural muscles or things like your eyes, um, can really be affected with myasthenia gravis. Um, botulism, which is a toxic process, causes similar effects, which is pretty interesting. Um, there's a little talk in the book and in the uh, module in Canvas about how um, botulinum uh, toxin, Botox, is used therapeutically to um, inhibit hyperactive muscles. So a lot of times it's with um, CNS lesions like a stroke or CP and um, it actually inhibits the uh, muscles so that increased weakness um, actually becomes an advantage when you're using it therapeutically so it's kind of interesting. So um, myopathies are disorders that are just to muscles not to the nervous system. So you get this your sensation and your autonomic function remain intact because the nervous system is not affected, but it affects coordination and muscle tone. Uh, I mean, it doesn't affect coordination and muscle tone and reflexes until the muscle atrophies so much that you're not getting good muscle activity. So there's a, um, a good picture in the module um, of a cross section of someone who has, um, and there also there's the picture of the um, traumatic uh, myelinopathy, which is 
a lot clearer in the module, I think, than it is in the PowerPoint, um, and of some of the other um, neuropathies. And there's a nice little animated picture of how the um, botulinum toxin works. Um, so in this picture, it shows the um, the muscle tissues actually being replaced with adipose tissue in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, this is a cross section of the gastrocnemius um, from someone with muscular dystrophy. So. Um, you get degeneration of the muscle fibers and the replacement of that with adipose tissue so you get reduced muscle force production but they still have sensory and autonomic because it's not the nervous system that's affected it is the muscles it's themselves so um, that is pretty interesting stuff I don't, I don't think I'm going to put anything about myopathies on the exam but um, it's just uh, it's just another um, thing that comes up when you're talking about the um, the peripheral nerve system. So, in uh, neuro rehab class with Jamie next quarter, you will talk about um, mus Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other forms of muscular dystrophy in the context of uh, pediatric treatment. So, um, the assignment this week is um, on nerve tension so you're going to find an everyday activity or position that mimics one of those nerve tension positions so if you take a look at those videos um, and find one of those that uh, mimics a, an everyday activity um, and it might be something that might aggravate a patient's nerve symptoms so we're just going to explore that a little bit it's kind of fun I, I put some examples of um, things that students from previous classes have posted just so you kind of get an idea of what I'm looking for. Okay, so um, pretty quick little chapter. We're going to wrap this up and um, then after this week we will move on to the spinal region and that is a really interesting chapter. We'll talk some about s spinal cord injuries and just the organization of the spinal region. We've touched on that a little bit in the somatosensory chapter and we're just going to go into it a little more um, closely and um, I think that's it for now.